Well, good afternoon, everybody, uh, and welcome to our webinar. Uh, really glad to have you here with us. It is 12 o'clock Central Time. Stephen and I are both coming to you from our new home bases at our uh, respective homes, and we're really glad that you could join us today <laughs> uh, for, our, uh, for our discussion. Uh, we're going to be talking about how to stay asynchronous, agile, and engaged, uh, and tools you can use to strengthen uh, your team's certainty. Uh, my name is Glenn Burnside. Uh, from Headspring. Joining me is my uh, friend and colleague, uh, Stephen Huerta from Workify. Hello. And uh, Stephen, uh, you want to take us away? Sure. Um, first, just some housekeeping. Um, we are scheduled for uh, a one hour session today, including Q&A. We're going to try to keep the, uh, the discussion or the, the content we're sharing with you um, as, as short as possible so we can give you as much time to, to ask questions, but there's a lot we want to cover. Um, this webinar will be recorded with that being said, and so we'll be we'll email all the, the content to participants um, as a follow-up. And, uh, and as a reminder, you can submit questions via uh, the GoToMeeting webinar question feature. Uh, so please submit those at any time and we'll be managing the queue. Uh, as far as what we're going to cover today, clearly these are um, unprecedented times. You know, I think, you know, if you had asked us, you know, you know, if you had told us rather that something like this would happen and we would have to respond the way that we are responding, uh, you know, we would never have guessed this, um, that it would be quite to this extent. Um, this is creating a lot of stress for everyone involved, for executives, managers, employees themselves. Uh, and really, you know, considering the stress that we're all going through, all of the uncertainty, you know, it's, it's a lot to deal with. And what we're going to cover today is, sorry, we're getting a little feedback, uh, apologies, is really how to deal with that uncertainty and more specifically build trust um, and engagement with your people, um, instilling confidence through asynchronous communication and agile practices, which is really what Glenn will be covering. Um, and then some uh, applicable uh, considering COVID-19, some methods for staying connected with your people and providing uh, feedback channels um, that are two-way in nature and that will give your employees a, a voice. Uh, and then of course, we will have a, a Q&A session. Um, so moving to quick introductions, uh, my name is Steven Huerta. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Workify. We're an all-in-one employee feedback platform. Uh, working with companies, you know, ranging from 100 to 10,000 employees. Um, and with me, I have Glenn Burnside, who's the Executive Vice President of Operations and Strategy at Headspring. Headspring is a software engineering consultancy uh, that focuses on transforming organizations with great software. So with that, I'm going to hand up, well, first, um, I'm going to start with a reflection, and then I'm going to hand over to Glenn to talk about um, how simple it, it, it has been to, uh, to respond <laughs> to, uh, to the coronavirus. And I think if we could do a, a virtual show of hands, I, I think it's safe to say that, um, that if not all of us, a very large um, percentage of us would say that we have, uh, we have purchased a Zoom license or GoToMeeting or Skype for business, whatever it is that you use. And, um, and when we got that in place, you know, it felt like we, uh, we were taking a major step in, in addressing the issues we were going to face. And, and so crisis has been averted, right, Glenn? How do you feel about this statement? <laughs> yeah, uh, absolutely. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I think we all, we all had a certain level of uh, hope uh, when this really started uh, a little over a week ago and became a, you know, a new reality uh, for how we're working here uh, uh, in all of our businesses. Um, but there's a reality that is, you know, that we're all going to have to adjust you know, uh, for this. And that's, we've got to solve for where and how and when our work happens. And it's going to be different in this environment. And so really, um, I think at first blush, you know, we may assume that this is all about tools and this is all about technology. And if we just roll out uh, a new tool, then uh, we're going to be able to get back to business as usual. But really uh, what we're seeing is that uh, the, the businesses that are really uh, it, dealing with this the best and having the best results for their people are the ones who are looking at this as an organizational design challenge, as a communication design challenge, as a work design challenge. Um, and so that really falls down to the where, the how, and the when. 
So how do we figure out the where? This is about establishing connectivity. We've got to make sure that our people uh, know where they're gonna be. We know where our work is gonna be. Uh, and ultimately also we know where we're gonna communicate. Um, so when we talk about where will we be? Uh, all right, so we're not in the office anymore. Some questions you wanna start asking yourself very quickly, very early on, if you haven't already. Do we all have the equipment we need to be productive? That may be different for you. Um, you know, We were able to make a pretty quick pivot at Headspring. Being in consulting, we're already used to a certain amount of travel, to a certain amount of working from lots of different locations. But uh, does everybody have that dedicated work environment? What's their personal internet, Wi-Fi connectivity? Do they have their computer? Um, you know, not everybody's on laptops. If you're pulling desktop systems, how do you get those out of the office and into everybody's home? Have they got the right connectivity tools, uh, fundamentals in place, a good webcam, a good headset, uh, a, a working phone, um, even as things as minor as monitors, keyboards, mouse. We have to think about these things early on because what we really want to do is replicate that ideal personal workstation to the extent that we can. And for every individual, uh, that's going to be a little bit different. And we have to recognize that, you know, um, different people are going to want to try to set up uh, it, their own space in different ways. So how quickly can we mobilize out that equipment to everyone? Uh, and how much can we support them in secondary spaces? So even if we're all working from home, well, and especially now, because a lot of us are under a shelter in place or, you know, stay at home advisories, but, um, you know, how, how much can we support those uh, secondary locations. Um, you know, if someone's got to get out for a little while, how do we adapt to them not necessarily being in that home environment? Or even if they, you know, need to get out and get some vitamin D and get on their back porch, uh, you know, how do we adapt to those locations uh, elegantly? Um, so beyond worrying about where our people are, we've got to start asking ourselves, where is our work going to be? Um, and again, you may be uh, one far into this spectrum where your operation is already 100% you know, running in the cloud, and that probably gives you a lot of organizational agility right now. Um, but what's already out there in the cloud? Um, what is it that we've got available through our software as a service products? And what's running on premise? Well, how much of it uh, of our business is inside the office still? And how much VPN capacity are we going to need for that connectivity? Uh, you know, we very quickly saw with some of our clients uh, that became a crippling factor for them because, uh, you know, if their their VPN wasn't current already, maybe struggling with a certain number of concurrent people. Now they're distributing instead of having 10 percent of their team out at any given time, 100 percent of their team is out uh, and now nobody can get in. Um, so, you know, you've got to start planning early for how do you build out that connectivity capacity back into the home base because you know if you've got on-premise uh work going on then someone's still got to reach back connect to it connect through it uh you know one of the big challenges we ran into was um working with a lot of our clients we work into their networks via vpn um so how do we get that out to all of our people reliably well you know we started spinning up vpn tunneling from our small internet out to our client internet so they only had to validate the one endpoint and then we could route all of our people through ours so they can connect to our home base our home base connects to their home base and so this isn't really even just about your team and and your people but it can be about the combination of your office your business your clients your vendors your partners um, and how do we all uh, still collaborate together uh, and then again, because we want to try to look at opportunities in here is what can we move out of the internet if it's inside it so we can reduce friction and still have you know reasonably secure access. Obviously with us, we're coming from a software engineering perspective and some of the first things we start looking at being able to move out so we can keep everybody moving is source control, the build and deploy servers, the work item tracking tools, the test environments. Um, and these are things that uh, you know can be moved fairly quickly uh, mobilized out if it's important, and then you can start getting access to it available to everybody. Uh, so if you're not already running source control on, on a hosted uh, environment like GitHub or Microsoft um, uh, Azure DevOps, you know, this may be the time to, to start moving in that direction and opening that up for your people. Uh, similarly, without having to worry so much about your core assets that are probably under some sort of HIPAA or you know, um, um, 
uh, PII kind of requirements, you know, those uh, IT infrastructure artifacts can start to move out of the building and start opening up more availability for people to work distributed. So things like those build and deploy servers, especially, you know, there may be an opportunity there. And just as importantly as where the work happens, and probably even more important from a whole organization standpoint, is where does the communication happen? And this can be a real adjustment early on if, uh, if what you're used to is most of your organizational communication happening via face-to-face -face meetings. Uh, and certainly that's where we, you know, it's easy to get that, that schedule replicated if we get everybody out, we get everybody on webcam and we keep having those face-to-face -face meetings. But what we find pretty quickly is that the setup and teardown on those can actually take a little bit longer um, when we're working distributed like this. And we're going to talk later about why there may be some other challenges for maintaining that. So now is the time to start asking ourselves, what are the right tools for the right purposes? Um, where, where do we use face-to-face? Uh, -face? Where do we use a phone call? Where do we use uh, email? Where do we use uh, instant messaging? Um, and then where do we uh, distribute that out? So how do we capture decisions in writing so we can all refer back to them later? Um, and how can we connect our progress tracking to our work products? And I think this is something that, again, coming from a software engineering team background, we're really used to doing already. Uh, but what we're finding that's really interesting now is that uh, other functions, other departments, other kinds of organizations very quickly in this environment are starting to realize the value of this. So having something on hand like Trello or like Jira or, again, Azure DevOps boards uh, can really open up a way so that your, um, your team, whatever team that may be, can, uh, you know, what we call it Headspring, to rally around the work. Um, and, you know, so, you know, even just this morning, uh, our executive team at Headspring, um, our CEO said to us, hey, listen, we've got a lot of committed actions that are out in flight right now. And so, you know, we're going to we're going to build out and we're actually going to keep our own board going to keep track of all of those. So everybody knows where to go look uh, to know what's going on in the organization. So this can work all the way from, you know, your 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 board of directors and your executive team all the way through. So having established on the, all of the where on this, uh, we have to talk about the how. This is a different way of living uh, right now, for sure. This is a different way of executing as a business. And so we're going to have to re, uh, kind of reimagine uh, some of our norms. You know, we've got to ask ourselves, how will we act? Uh, <laughs> how will we show progress? And uh, most importantly, how will we establish trust? Um, you know, one of the big challenges we have as we move a lot of these things out in how we communicate is that uh, human beings, you know, we pick up about 90% of what we infer from our interactions with other people based on body language, based on nonverbal communication. Um, so we've got to really go out of our way in this new environment to, to build up and find new ways to establish trust and understanding between ourselves. So when we talk about how will we act, um, you know, it sounds kind of funny. Uh, at first, but I don't know, some of y'all may have already seen some of the absolute like video conference fails videos that are showing up on Twitter of um, people just completely forgetting that they're on camera. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and you know, this is, a, this is an interesting time maybe to get to know your coworkers in a more personal way than you would have ever dreamed or wanted to. Um, but you know, a distributed workforce is still a professional workforce. So on camera dress and appearance matters. Um, and that may be as simple as making sure everyone understands that, hey, we, you know, we're not coming to work in our PJs. Um, <laughs> um, you know, one of the big things we found is that if we establish some different expectations for uh, how we conduct meetings, so booking them for 25 minutes instead of 30, uh, booking them for 50 minutes instead of an hour, uh, really helps everybody have room to transition. Uh, especially if you've got folks like Steven today, who's got back-to-back -back meetings right back behind this webinar uh, that may have to get off and then shift and possibly jump over to a whole different platform because even though we're using, um, you know, GoToWebinar internally, then he's got to get Zoom. Um, and then, um, you know, so when we're booking these meetings, we're making sure that we're scheduling time for setup. Um, you know, making sure we're, set, we're setting time for teardown, making sure we're uh, giving people room and, you know, space to move between these things. Um, 
in the physical environment, a lot of that happens naturally because you've got to get up from the room and you've got to go walk to the next meeting and someone's got to get in and set up. And it's easy for us to forget in this environment that we don't necessarily have those natural transition points. So let's, you know, help everybody find a way to build them in together. Um, Oh, Glenn, uh, on the last bullet point here is showing uh, grace and forgiveness. We've lost, um, we can't hear your audio right now. Hello. There you are. Okay. And I promise y'all that wasn't even scripted. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you. And I think that's a really important point in all of this too, is um, as much as we want to bring our best to the table every time, and as much as we want to do our best possible effort at uh, making this work for everybody, uh, we also want to uh, be sure that we're dealing with mistakes by others with grace and forgiveness and understanding that uh, there's new challenges in play for all of us here. Um, so just like we talk, you know, we want to make sure we all understand how we want to act. Um, this is a time to start asking ourselves, how do we show progress? Um, you know, how do we know, how do we know that work is happening? And especially if you're used to that answer being through face-to-face -face status meetings and through managers querying for what's going on, that becomes a lot harder to do. So how do we turn that inside out? You know, um, and a lot of these things, what I love about this is that this starts to you know, open up opportunities for maybe transforming ways of doing work that can really carry on even well after we're all back to uh, not uh, <laughs> uh, hold up in our home offices and able to go out face to face again, but you know, uh, using information radiators to keep everyone tracking to the same goals. Making the work progress, the burn downs, your project management reports uh, in a lot of organizations, those are very tightly held pieces of information that maybe only the project managers see or maybe only directors see. Um, start making those public to the whole team, to the whole you know, uh, department across uh, teams so that they can start to understand how are they progressing relative to how other teams are progressing. Uh, one of the big things we've seen that's been really helpful for us in this is just getting the app notifications into our instant message channels so that you don't necessarily have to go out of your way to announce things, um, but you can still be sure that everybody's getting the appropriate notifications. So for instance, at Headspring, one of the first things we did, uh, we set up a, a special Confluence Corona COVID-19 updates space wiki, um, and we set up a Corona communications Slack channel, and we made sure that we integrated those two things together. So every time we've got a new update, that we've got a new announcement we want to send out to everybody. Uh, we write it up, we put it in the wiki, and it immediately tells everyone in the channel that there's a new announcement, a new content, and gives you a preview of it. So then they know that, hey, there's something important there that I need to go and read. Um, you know, taking advantage of things like that, this is a great time to help make sure that information flows out from the source uh, and reaches everyone at the right time. Uh, or in a way that, uh, as we'll talk about in a minute, that maybe it isn't, it's the right time for you to send it, but it isn't the right time for them to read it, and that's okay. Uh, and then the last thing, and I think that this is something that uh, can be really helpful as you're designing your rhythms and you know, how to conduct your day, is uh, separating your information sharing from your decision making. Uh, so again, taking advantage of the tools we have to make sure that we are um, you know, socializing um, you know, status, information, analysis, conclusions, um, you know, in advance, uh, and then being able to use our time together, that face-to-face -face time, bringing that together to really do the decision-making based on the information that everybody's had uh, an opportunity to already absorb. Uh, and again, a lot of this is about, um, you know, how do we help everyone rally around the work um, and not be stuck in face-to-face uh, in, in -face online video conference sessions all day long, every day. Uh, because there's still work that's got to be done. Uh, and then, like I said, most important, how do we establish trust? Um, and this has to start with leadership. This has to start with a deliberate decision that we are, are going to create a remote work environment that encourages transparent and comprehensive communication um, that assumes that, um, that people 
want to do a great job and 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 want to do what's best for the organization. Um, so you know, recognizing when you're not in sync with others, um, escalate immediately. And what I mean by that is, um, uh, like I said earlier, a lot of our communication is nonverbal. Uh, a lot of what we take in and un, and infer is nonverbal. So if I'm if I'm emailing with Stephen and my email comes across and sounds really terse and maybe um, you know it doesn't have a lot of um, uh, happy face emojis at the end of it, you know Stephen might read that and think, oh my gosh, like Glenn is really mad, uh, like super, like I'm in trouble, like something's wrong. And really, all I'm doing is I'm just trying to type real fast and get it out and get on to the next thing. Um, so, you know, so the best thing then is to recognize we need to escalate the immediacy of how we're interacting. So probably instead of emailing, you know, uh, Stephen wants to maybe, you know, should raise it to like uh, an instant message and say, hey, I want to check in. Did I understand this right? Um, and then if I, you know, instant message him back just as tersely, then, you know, maybe he wants to call me and then we can start to get some of those verbal cues going on as well. Um, so it's really up to all of us to make sure that we're escalating in the um, like connectedness as needed uh, so that we stay in sync with the people that we're working with and that we're always assuming the best possible interpretation of what we're inferring from everyone else around us. Um, well, I'll say this, uh, that we also have seen that um, when we are having those face-to-face -face meeting times, when we're bringing everybody together, uh, it makes such a world of difference to turn the video screens on. Uh, and to uh, turn on the screen sharing and so that we've actually got something that we're all looking at together at the same time um, versus what we've seen some of our clients, you know, kind of have gotten into the habit of over the years is just dialing in on the conference line, um, assume everybody's looking at the same spreadsheet at the same time. Um, you know, we please turn your eyes now to cell B12. Um, so much better when we can actually turn on the video screen, see everybody, see the smiles, see the questions, see the body language. Um, and then finally, I just want to say set protocols for different channels. Um, and this has been really important to say, you know, uh, we're going to use email for uh, sharing, you know, highly relevant, urgent information. We're going to use our instant messaging for more casual, uh, you know, types of information. We're going to use our, our, our video conferencing for when we absolutely need everyone together. Um, but at the same time, you know, like one of the things we've done that has been, I think, really helpful for our team as we said, you know, um, we're, we're missing out on those like happy coincidences that happen in the break room. Um, and and so, uh, you know, we we created a uh, an online virtual meeting called the break room. And so you can just go in there and join in at any given time. Right. Um, we created a, a Slack channel called Now Playing. And so uh, every now and then people just post in there and talk about what music they're listening to wherever they are, and then you can go, you know, give it a listen on Spotify and and, and gives you that opportunity to have a, a time of sharing that's um, more of that kind of serendipitous, um, you know, encounters that we run into when we're all together in the same place for an extended period of time. Um, now, I think this is the most important thing that's happening that we're all having to get used to. Uh, and that I think it represents both a set of challenges right now and also a set of opportunities coming out of this period. And that's dealing with being asynchronous. Um, and, and, and just in case, uh, you know, we're not sure what that is. Um, we're talking about things or events or, or, or that are happening at different times, not existing at the same time. So today we're all here on this webinar at the same time. Um, but, uh, you know, maybe somebody's working in a different time zone uh, and they're not going to be able to dial in for this and that's okay too so we have to plan for asynchrony in this work environment um, and the reality is is that we have async people that means that work is going to happen asynchronously and when work happens asynchronously communication about the work happens asynchronously so why would we have async people if all we did was send everybody home well uh, especially if you're dealing in, a, you know, working in a larger organization, uh, this is something you're already used to. I know that, uh, you know, in my time at Dell, this was a reality for us is you've got people that are in different time zones. Their work, their natural work day is starting and stopping, um, you know, at different periods of time. Um, this is a minor issue, potentially, if, you know, if some of you are in New York and some of you are in L.A. 
and you're only dealing with a three hour or a four hour difference, um, it can be a lot more profound if you're dealing with teams or parts of teams that are all over the globe. Um, some people are gonna time shift, uh, especially now during this period. They may start their day a little earlier uh, and finish a little earlier. They may start their day a little later and finish their day a little later. Um, but even if all of that is all, you know, like uh, staying the same for you and those are things you're already used to, there's a new kind of asynchrony that's kicking in all over the place for us, uh, which is that we're dealing with um, events and activities inside our homes that we're not used to dealing with um, uh, when we're at work and when we're able to really separate those two things. And so, you know, I might be starting my day like I always do at eight o'clock, but it may not all happen in eight straight hours. Um, you know, there's things that are happening here at the house. Uh, I'm sure a lot of y'all are like this too. I've got a son who's home from college right now who's trying to figure out how to do his own online learning. I've got another one who's in high school who's getting started back up on that. And um, you know who's IT tech support at the house? It's uh, <laughs> it's also me. So you know there are interruptions. It's it's not going to be continuous. It's not going to be predictable. Um, and certainly what we've seen too is we've got people who are juggling childcare uh, between partners, and so they may be having to shift. Yeah, Stephen is. Um, they may be having to shift pieces or parts of their day. So it's maybe four hours in the morning, eight to twelve, and then their partners taking the twelve to four shift, and then they're coming back on and working. You know four to eight in the evening. Um, and this is just the reality. This is reality. Uh, and so the, what this starts with, number one, is for all of us uh, in owning our experience in this, which is to communicate our needs and our expectations to our teams around us. And we call this educating your environment. Um, so making sure everybody knows what your reality is at your house and what it means for how you're going to work is the very best thing that we can do to uh, make sure that we're all staying um, we're staying in sync on intent and expectations, even if we can't stay in sync in time. Um, so asynchronous work. Now this, uh, this I think, again, is, is, is more of a work design, organizational design issue than anything that you can necessarily fix with a tool. Um, but knowing that we've got people who are scattered in time um, and we can't rely on all the work happening in lockstep down the line because you know we're not working in factories, we're not working assembly lines. Um, you know the opportunity here is to break work down into smaller units, smaller chunks, so that smaller pieces of it can make progress independently from each other, um, or so that we can get the team to rally around the different pieces and then based on their time and their availability, um, you know schedule it out during the day so that it all comes together by when it's due. Um, so this requires a lot of deeper insight with our project managers and our product managers. And this is really their opportunity to shine, I think, in helping figure out how do we design that work breakdown structure to account for um, the asynchronous world we're living in. Um, and you know, again, coming from the software engineering world, um, it's really easy for us to just write a one-liner task out that says something like uh, upgrade website. And then, you know, we're all working on upgrade website together for who knows how many months. Um, but it's a lot harder in that world to know, especially when everything is async, to know if you're really making progress or not. So know your epics from your user stories, from your tasks, um, and uh, figure out what is the right cadence and granularity of work. But the more you can focus on those smaller batches with higher turnover, um, the more you're going to be able to maintain the agility and the uh, delivery velocity you need without having to count on everybody being in there at the same time. Um, and then lastly, async communication. Uh, again, if you're used to doing everything face to face um, and, and having everybody call in for every meeting, uh, we're going to have to deal with a different reality there. Uh, you know, your team stand up may not even be able to happen at the same time, depending on how people's days are shifted and their work availability is shifted. Um, so, you know, how do you find those opportunities? to keep the communication going, keep the connect connectivity going, but also account for some of that distribution. So again, you know, there's a lot of opportunities out there, um, things that you can do where uh, instead of having a face-to-face -face synchronous stand-up, um, you know, have a stand-up Google Doc and have everybody put their stand-up notes in there for the day uh, and then have it, you know, as long as everyone knows when it needs to be done by, now everybody's got, again, something that they can go back and refer to see what it was. They didn't necessarily have to all be there at the same time. Um, 
So, you know, all team meetings at set times don't necessarily work anymore. And that's just something that we have to recognize and, and get creative around solving for. Um, so one of the best things we can do there too is start to get really clear on what meetings are mandatory, um, you know, and what meetings are discretionary. Uh, and um, and it's, this is a really fun exercise to do because what you start to see is that people will vote with their feet and their, and their time on uh, the meetings and the sessions that they're actually getting value from. And so if you start to notice that, hey, I've, I've made this optional and now nobody comes to it, well, maybe it wasn't that valuable of a meeting uh, in the first place, or maybe there's, a, there's an asynchronous option that we can replace it with. Um, and then, you know, like I said, that uh, when, when things are optional or when things are time shifted, this is where the leadership opportunity really kicks in. Uh, because when you know that not everyone's there to get the message, you're going to have to work extra hard as a leader to create context beforehand and make sure that you're communicating decisions out afterwards so that even the folks who weren't there when it all happened have got an opportunity to see it, absorb it, um, you know, and weigh in on it. So we get all of that locked down and we are back up into full productivity. And uh, so naturally then uh, everybody's morale and engagement uh, just runs off the charts is just linearly correlated with productivity. Um, and I think that, um, uh, I don't know, Stephen, maybe that is that, that's been your experience, right? It, if it were only that easy, Glenn, um, the, the reality is, you know, all of the things that, uh, that you've just walked through are, are clearly things that we face, but, um, and we were hoping that it would be as simple as just getting the work construct in place, but, you know, we've got a lot of work ahead of us and, you know, we're going to have to, uh, we, uh, the, the kind of royal we, you know, as managers and as colleagues, uh, we're going to have to stay attuned to uh, and attentive to, to employee engagement and, you know, where, you know, people's sentiment, you know, some of the things that they're dealing with. You, you, one of the, the things that you mentioned is, you know, showing grace and empathy um, and, and really trying to understand, you know, our colleague's situation because of all the factors that are involved. Like, Within the last 30 minutes, I've got a contractor who is hammering right outside my window. My daughters could walk in, in into, my, into my room at any point in time. And so, so the reality is, you know, I have a lot of things going on and these things are distracting me. And, you know, the, uh, you know my need to kind of share the challenges that I'm working through it has never been higher. And, and, you know, that's really, you know, when, when we start thinking about, you know, staying connected to your people um, and, and really creating um, channels for, you know, information, for feedback that used to be very easy. You know, Glenn, you mentioned some of the serendipitous ways that um, employees, you know, would interact at HeadSpring. Same holds true at Workify. And when you remove that from the equation, when you remove those interactions, um, it, it becomes a, a major challenge. And, you know, we believe and, and our clients are fearing that we're just at the beginning of that. Like we're so, we're still so focused on the blocking and tackling right now that um, we haven't even created the channel to hear what the real struggles are. Um, and so some of the, the critical success factors, you know, I, I think, you know, it, it's really to reiterate some of the things that, you know, to, to dovetail and segue from, from Glenn's portion of the presentation, you know, maintaining business continuity is is absolutely key, and we believe the winners. Um, and as you know, we, we're we're I'm a very strong believer that in any market, there's an you know, you create an opportunity to uh, to to thrive, and uh, it's just difficult to see that in difficult markets like the one we're in. And so maintaining continuity is, is going to be paramount and then adapting to the new normal is, uh, is, is going to be really a, a difference maker in, in our opinion. Um, you know, this specific situation with COVID-19, it's, it's, you know, this is the first, you know, recession or, you know, downturn that has been a self-inflicted wound. And, and because of that, this situation is, is really, really um, precarious, right? And understanding that the unique impacts that, that it's having on our businesses, like we have clients that have had to completely shut down um, for two months and, um, and they're furloughing, furloughing employees, 
and and there's a lot going on um and so you know addressing those the barriers that you, that are in the way of your employees getting their jobs done is is really really uh critical um a key way of you know bridging the gap in in establishing a new connection is really looking at um tools that are geared toward these sorts of situations um and there are really two that you know we are talking about day in day out with our clients one is creating an open channel for employees to provide feedback and ask questions you may have heard these referred to as a suggestion box in the old days they're literally wooden boxes on the wall or you know on someone's desk in hr's you know in hr's cube um there are digital suggestion boxes that um that now exist um, some companies, you know, and we'll, we'll get to some, some of the solutions in a sec, but, you know, we're seeing more and more companies adopt these uh, always on open channels for employees to, to push feedback on their terms. Um, and that is, uh, that could be a, a really, really uh, impactful way of, of establishing a new connection that you may not have. Um, polling employees and and you know most of you probably have some engagement survey people survey that you're doing either through a best places to work or you're you know you're doing your marketing or hr departments or doing a company-wide engagement survey these are larger surveys they're geared to to really assess progress as an organization over a period of time that's not what we're talking about here what we're talking about are shorter poll surveys that will give you input quickly and will help you address some of these, um, ensure some of these critical success factors um, in, in a shorter period of time. Um, and so quickly, I'm gonna, to dive into some of these, I'm gonna go pretty quickly because I, I think we're, um, you know, we're starting to run a little short on time. Um, again, all of the information we're providing um, will be uh, part of the, the materials that we send as a follow-up. Also, you know, Workify is offering some of our, um, some of our resources um, as a uh, to to anyone on this call, uh, whether it is the always on feedback channel or some of the post servers that we're going to talk about. And so there's going to be a lot more information coming to you uh, in terms of the always on feedback channel. Uh, again, we've talked about some of the solutions. There are very, very easy to deploy practical solutions. Glenn mentioned one, which is creating a Slack channel or a Workify Teams channel that is dedicated to an area or aspect that you want to get get feedback. That is a great way. It's quick to deploy. It's going to be part of the tool set that you already have in place. Um, one of the challenges with that is, you know, there there isn't an anom anonymous feature, or there's a perception that it is it is not anonymous. And you know, the situation we're in today is literally impacting every aspect of our lives. Um, and because of that, you know, there's heightened sensitivity around these questions that I have, um, you know, and we're all kind of wired different ways. You know, I am very, you know, forthcoming. When I have questions, I will ask it. I don't care if it's attributed to me. Um, but there are whole generations of the workforce that do not operate that way. And, um, and having a, an anonymous option, we believe, is really, really, really important, particularly in these times. And so some of the use cases that I, I want to run through um, will uh, that you know will will be extremely helpful uh, for you to to consider you know offering to your employees um, you know policy changes um, around working remotely. If you are implementing some of the things that Glenn walked us through, there's going to be a lot of changes in a lot of different aspects of the the job. You know where you used to go get information may not be where you get information now. The wiki page. Um, may be updated on a more regular basis, um, but we may not want to push a notification to everyone, so you may need to go check the Slack channel. So there, there's a lot of things that are changing rapidly. An anonymous feedback channel um, or just a, an always-on feedback channel uh, gives your employees the ability to quickly um, quickly ask a question. And with the, the Workify Conversations tool or some of the other tools out there, there's actually an assignment feature where an administrator gets a question and can sign it out to another person within the organization or management team. Um, escalating issues, um, you know, sometimes, you know, the normal course, the normal chain of command 
um, is is not going to be, you know, sometimes it's not effective in the normal course of business. In these situations, it can be even more difficult to escalate something that's really blocking um, from a resources standpoint, some critical needs that you have. Um, uh, and always on feedback channel is a very easy way for your employees to kind of push that heads up to management like, hey, you know, I am having connectivity issue or hey, I don't have, you know, um, any good options when it comes to childcare and managing my meetings. Is there someone in HR I can talk to? Um, and so escalating issues uh, that, that relate to resources is going to be is, is a typical use case we're seeing. Submitting questions about benefits and health care more directly. Um, there, there may or may not have been a change in impact directly to your individual employees. Um, maybe not yet. Maybe hopefully not at all. But in times of high stress like this, there are a lot of questions that, that your employees are going to have that are just being triggered. And, um, and so this will give them kind of a structured place to, to be able to submit the question. And uh, in most of these tools, you can start to give kind of standardized responses on, on, on questions that, that, that are appropriate to, to provide a standard response. And then we don't want to forget about kudos. Um, and so giving kudos to the company or to individuals um, I, that, that's a good way, and a lot of our clients are, are taking kind of snippets of their um, anonymous suggestion board, and they're, sh they're sharing these in, like, weekly team meetings, um, or they're kind of aggregating them in a slide that says, like, these are the things that have happened, you know, over the last week, um, successes that we're having as a company and as fellow colleagues. And so those are just a few uh, examples, but the key thing here is, again, having an always on channel for communication. It's not Slack, it's not email, that is something a little more personal um, that ideally will provide your, your, your people with an anonymous option uh, if that's, if that's um, something that makes sense for your business. Um, quickly, uh, you know, poll surveys. You know, I mentioned earlier that um, we're not referring to these really long, clunky you know, engagement surveys. You know, we do recommend that you do not fully abandon those either. We'll talk about that in a sec. But in in times of crisis, you know, we we find that our, our clients and companies are much more effective in deploying these smaller surveys. A, a, a poll survey can be a micro survey from a single question all the way to what we believe is a 10 question survey. Um, we feel the sweet spot, you know, to get critical data, meaningful data is around, you know, six questions. So we find that our clients are deploying pulse surveys that are six to 10 questions. These are a mix of quantitative questions and qualitative questions. Um, that way you're not overwhelming whoever is having to digest these results. Um, and you're, you're able to, to move forward with clear action. And, um, and so these poll surveys right now should be topical. Um, everything that you see in this list, and these are drafts, and if, if you're interested, we have uh, worked with our IO psychology team to develop templates that we, we are happy to share with you um, that focus on these four areas. Um, three are kind of point in time, like one-time surveys. You could do them on a recurring basis if you would like, um, but these are, this is the trend of all of our clients and all of, of all the HR practitioners that we have in our advisory network um, that our that companies are focusing on right now. I'm not going to go through all these the details because they're pretty self self explanatory. But you know, one is focusing on how your organization's responding to uh, to this disaster situation with COVID-19. Um, are your employees getting the, the information they need? Do they have a form to ask? Um, you know, those sorts of things. Um, then we have a we we find that another pulse that's specific to the remote working arrangement. And again, this is more about how connected are we as a business. And are we, um, you know, are we, are we, are we giving you the tools that you need to work remotely? <clears throat> that kind of segues into the next pulse, which is extremely applicable right now, but is really a deeper dive into the resources. Do you have all the tools that you need from a, a tool set perspective, but also from a people and management perspective? You know, have you not heard from your management? Have you, have you had a one-on-one -on -one or not? You know, these are the sorts of things that the resource pulse is going to look at. Um, and if you use um, a tool that's ge geared for poll survey, typically you can do this anonymously and still, you know, use the metadata to understand what departments are suffering the worst. 
um, as a result of the change in how we're working. Um, and the last one is more of a continuous improvement. Uh, a lot of our clients are not resting on their laurels, going back to, uh, to you know, the, st the first statement we had was, you know, is turning on Zoom, you know, is that it? It's not it. Um, and we shouldn't assume as managers that we have all the answers. Um, our people um, have great ideas for innovation. And so the Innovation Pulse is a weekly survey that you can use to get, um, to get, to get ideas on how to make improvements. Very quickly, I said earlier that, you know, the poll surveys aren't going to focus on the, these 30, 40 question engagement surveys. Do not abandon all the, you know, standard business um, as usual feedback loops that you have. I'll comment on this here in a second, you know, in my wrap up, but, you know, we are all of this, all of the infrastructure changes, the team, you know, the team uh, design changes are, are, are all geared to getting us back to, um, you know, business as usual. And when you, um, when you, you can't lose sight on the fact, it can be really hard to, to, and some managers are fearful of asking employees how they're doing um, and getting feedback using the normal loops. Um, you can't drop those. And so, I'll, I'll touch on that here again in a sec, um, but really quickly, Glenn, if there are three things that you want um, our audience to walk away with, you know, what are those from your portion of the, the presentation? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, you know, for me, the, the saying that keeps coming back to mind as we uh, have gotten into this new reality is um, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Uh, and so, you know, for me, that means the first thing we've got to do is we've got to make sure that we, we equip everyone for this journey um, to make sure that our teams, our, our team members are set up for success uh, from the get go. Uh, you know, establish those new rhythms, make sure we understand how we're working, what's the timing, what's the pulsing, what's the cadencing, what are the new norms, because there are going to be new norms, whether we um, design them or whether they just happen by accident. Uh, and then lastly, make the work visible. When the work is visible, uh, then everybody can rally around it and, uh, and we can all see the value that everyone else in the team is bringing. And so for me, we do all three of those things. That's how we stay productive. Stephen, how about you? Yeah, on my side, once you've, you've done those three things, um, you know, establish, you know, ways of staying connected with your people and, um, and getting their feedback. And, and that's a two way street. So, you know, you want to pull feedback from your people. You want to allow, enable your employees to push feedback to you. Um, have a two-way dialogue. Um, with that said, you need to listen to your employees. It's never been more important right than right now to listen to your people, listen to what they're saying, um, listen to what their concerns are, uh, what their ideas are for improvements. Um, and then lastly, you don't drop your normal feedback cadences. You know, it's going to be hard. You know, your instinct is we should not you know, do these things right now or next quarter or even six months from now. But the reality is you want to build the trust, as Glenn mentioned, and by sticking to what you've done in the past uh, from an engagement survey and a feedback measurement perspective, um, you're going to maintain that trust and you're going to get better as, an, as a company. Thank you. I couldn't and agree more. I think that that brings us to the, the Q&A section of, of the presentation. So love to hear from y'all on the line. And thank you for sticking with us on this journey. Uh, open it up for questions through the Q&A panel. All right, looks like got a few coming in here. So uh, this question says, so, okay, yeah, I'll jump on this one. So it says, how do you measure productivity in a remote environment? Are there specific metrics we should look at or questions we should ask? Uh, boy, <laughs> um, I think it's interesting when we're all in the same office together, you know, we, we use a lot of proxies for, for productivity. Are people at their desk? Um, you know, are, are people banging out lines of code? Um, do they look busy? Uh, and, you know, it's also easy to fall into uh, an over metric view if you're too far removed from what's happening every day, uh, which is, you know, the classic was always lines of code written per day for us, you know, when I was a young engineer, uh, <laughs> which I think, I think Bill Gates said, you know, measuring software by lines of code written is like measuring building an airplane by weight. Um, 
So the way I look at this is number one, it's going to be different for every team and it's going to be different for every uh, department. Um, but you know, the more that you can level out the, the size of, of a work unit and really look at as a team, how much of those, how many of those are we delivering over time is going to help you understand a team level productivity by, uh, by throughput. And throughput for us is always across a velocity and quality. So, you know, you can't give up one of those for the other. So taking measurement on both of those at the same time is what really tells you if you're actually maintaining your intended levels of throughput. Um, when you get down into an individual level, I think that this is a lot less about measuring productivity and a lot more about monitoring accountability. Uh, and this is where your daily stand-up rhythms and your daily commitments are some of your best indicators of trends over time. So if I have my daily stand-up with Steven and every day, you know, I tell him my top priority today to accomplish is to finish this feature. And then the next day I say, well, I didn't get it done. So today my top priority is to get it done. And then the next day I say, well, I kept working on it. I'm making good progress, but it's still not done. That's our opportunity to say, hey, listen, let's talk about what else is going on because uh, that's been your top priority to finish for the last three days. So uh, what's happening? What are the blockers? Um, do you need to just, you know, do we, you just need to sit down for a minute and, and talk us through it and let's get you unstuck. Um, so really for me, it's not so much at the individual level about measuring productivity, like I said, as it is about monitoring for accountability. And if we can create environments where we are able to maintain joint accountability with each other as a team, that not only fosters an environment of trust, but it also helps people to understand that um, what they're ultimately are uh, responsible for at the end of the day is meeting up to the commitments they make. Um, thank you, thank you, great question. Oh, Stephen, you might, maybe you could uh, take a crack at this one. It says, I, uh, I work in an accounting firm. This time of year is normally really hard for engagement. Any suggestions on team engagement, fun activities, et cetera? Yeah, that that is, um, you know, we find that a lot of the a lot of the social events that were happening in person, um, believe it or not, are are still happening, but they're happening in kind of a Zoom meeting. Um, so we see a lot of our clients doing Zoom happy hours. Um, we see a lot of you can't, um, you know, ping pong is not an option. Well, at least very, I, I saw, you know, through like vi the video games or I'm not a gamer, but I do know ping that pong. there are a lot of virtual games. There are a lot of virtual games that are happening right now. Um, and so, you know, our recommendation is, you know, don't abandon what you were doing in the past. Like that doesn't only apply to like, you know, measuring engagement, but how you engage. And so if you had um, an every Wednesday uh, uh, Catan party, like you can, there's still ways that you can have those sorts of interactions through Zoom meetings or, or virtual meetings. And, um, and we see a lot of our clients are doing that. Um, the a way that you could get that feedback is whether it doesn't even have to be a fancy way through a, a Slack poll or through a, a survey monkey, or if you have a poll survey tool, you should pull your employees, get their feedback and, and, and ask them for ways that they want to engage uh, or give them a few options. Um, maybe some of the ideas that, that I just shared, you know, would resonate with your company. Um, but but ask them and, and, and get them in and get them bought into the different ways that you guys can reconnect in this new normal. So it looks like we got uh, another one here. I think uh, this. Oh, yeah, we're coming right on our time. So we should watch this. This might, this might be our last one. And I think, uh, Stephen, you and I both might have a take on this one. It says, what advice do you have regarding how inundated employees are with information? Uh, we want to provide them with tools and resources, but I'm concerned we're trying to make them drink from a fire hose. Um, yeah, that's the um, that's the flip side of the always the always on, always connected life. And I know that there are days when um, uh, Slack um, doesn't it doesn't feel like there's a lot of Slack in Slack. It feels pretty tight. There's a lot happening there, um, and you can miss some things if they fly by too fast. 
Uh, I'll say right now, the, um, the feedback we've had from our team at least has been, um, uh, there's no way we could possibly over communicate right now. And they are, uh, you know, have told us that they really appreciate the fact that we're putting information out, we're putting it out through multiple channels, um, and we're and we're going out of our way to make sure we're connecting them with it. And so I think uh, right now, I might not worry too much about accidentally over communicating. Um, that said, uh, I think being really deliberate about what communication channels you use for what kind of information and how frequently. Uh, can really help with managing that. So, um, you know, rather than, for instance, um, every time there's a new news article, we send a Slack link out about it immediately and someone's just constantly throwing stuff out there. If we have like a known rhythm, so for instance, our CEO has been really deliberate since all of this started that, you know, um, on Tuesdays, he's going to send an update out at the end of the day. Um, and then again, on, uh, on, on Thursdays, he's going to send an update out at the end of the day. And then everybody knows that on our Friday all hand, which is a regularly scheduled meeting, that that's their opportunity then to, you know, ask uh, anything that they may have seen that process through that. Um, so that if you know in advance what your timing and your cadencing is going to be, then you give yourself permission to batch those things up and then get them out to everybody. Um, and again, you know, having having it in a durable location and then being able to let everybody know where that durable location is can be a lot more effective than throwing it out piecemeal in, in an instant messaging channel or throwing it out, um, you know, just by email. Um, so uh, I think that's something to think about doing as well. And, um, but right now, like I said, um, the, what we've heard and what I've heard from, you know, clients at the other end of the spectrum is like, no one's telling us anything. And uh, the reality is, is that in the absence of information, people come up with their own story. Uh, and it's our job as leaders to help shape uh, uh, our team's contextual awareness so that they can tell themselves the most accurate possible story about what's happening. What do you think, Stephen? You know, I think that's right. And the only thing that I'll add um, is that if you feel like you, you aren't getting it right or you are overwhelming your employees, you should ask them. I mean, that could be a good you know, poll survey topic, and that could be a really, really short, you know, three, four question polls. Are you getting the information? You, 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 are you getting the information you need? Are you getting in the ways that you would yeah. like to receive it? Um, and, you know, is there any, you know, in, in the last week, is there anything critical that you felt like you're, you were left out on? And, um, and so as a follow up to whoever submitted that question, you know, we have communication polls, you know, examples that we would be happy to share as well. So ask your employees and, 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 and get a sense from them whether, you know, how things are going. Perfect. Perfect. All right. Well, in the spirit of trying to uh, model what we uh, advised everyone to do and try to leave a few minutes between uh, sessions to go and reset and recontextualize, uh, and, and it looks like we've actually been able to answer pretty much everybody's questions. Um, anything we didn't get to answering, uh, we will do our best to try to follow up with on email. And we thank you all for all the questions you submitted. Again, this session is being recorded. Uh, we'll be sending that out afterwards with some additional resources. We hope that you will uh, share it around uh, your organizations as well. Um, and uh, last but not least, as, as we leave here, uh, please do keep in touch with us. You can always find us at uh, headspring.com, getworkify.com, by email at info at, look us up, join us, uh, follow the conversation with us on Twitter, um, or check out some of our open source projects that we've published on Headspring Labs on GitHub. Uh, we'd love to get your uh, pull requests and submissions back to those as well. So uh, we just want to, uh, you know, hope that everybody continues to keep calm, carry on, stay productive, stay engaged. And uh, thank you all again for uh, for joining us here today. Uh, we're going to sign we'll off. Get through this, guys. Have a great afternoon. Take care. Goodbye, bye. everybody.